Welcome to the fourth episode of Portfolio Cast. Today we're speaking with Steve Chambers. Steve is an advocate of charities of all sizes involved in the built environment and sustainable transport sectors. Whilst leading policy and campaigning roles, he has also been a subject matter expert, which has led to a portfolio career that includes being a lecturer and a media spokesperson. Welcome, Steve. Hello. Hi. So in my introduction, I've just given a flavour of what you do and have done in your working career. And the roles have been many and varied. I'd like to jump in with a question on how you have made your choices. What has driven your portfolio career along this path? Okay, there's a couple of different things to kind of balance in a portfolio career. For me personally, although there's been a lot of different kind of roles doing different things, being a campaigner, being an advisor, being a lecturer, I've stuck to two niche areas really built environment, urban planning, and sustainable transport. And I've sold myself as an expert in those areas. So I haven't spread that part too thin. Where I've been super flexible is with what the doing actually is. And that's where I've actually found myself coming into roles that at the beginning I didn't anticipate. Some of them I knew I wanted to do. I wanted to become a lecturer. I wanted to do that. I didn't know I wanted to be a campaigner at the beginning. That that kind of evolved, that presented itself. But all, and this is the crucial thing, I think, based on that subject knowledge that I held myself to. Yeah, and that specialism, I mean, we, we see it again and again, and we actually advise on that during our Catapult course, for example, is find your specialism, because mm. there are a lot of people in the world, there are a lot of people probably in your market, unless you are specifically very niche, but finding that specialism is going to be your strength, right? I have, as my career has moved on, I've identified areas that I thought were useful for me to get into because of where I wanted to go and I have broadened out but it was a very gradual evolution it wasn't just spreading myself too thin in in terms of those things and kind of the reason I think I've part of the reason of sticking to that niche area is partly it's easier to explain yourself and promote yourself that way but what I think is more important in choices and something you don't really see if you look at someone's CV yeah you don't see two things. You don't see the rate and you don't see the reliability of yeah. that work. And actually, a lot of the choices that I've made have been about one thing I think is very important for a portfolio career is to have a bread and butter job, yep. something that's reliable. It's maybe one or two days a week. That work's probably going to be there for quite a while. It's yeah. maybe at a lower rate, but that's going to pay the bills. And it might not be the thing that you're most into. Don't do things you don't want to do, but it might not be the thing you're most into. And then you can use your other days for things that are a higher rate because they're less secure. They they may be the more passion projects for you. So you don't see that when you look at a career of of a portfolio career person, but those decisions are actually as important as where is this taking me? What am I going to be doing? Yeah, that balance between stability and passion is something that we really have to strive for, right? Because... Often it's just passion driving us. Also, you have that fear with stability, right? You go out to lots of different roles and you say yes a lot, especially in the beginning. Mm. Um, But that can lead you down a path which is harder to maintain, perhaps. Yeah, I mean, well, the the trouble with saying yes a lot and filling your time with work is that may prevent you, and this is something I've learned, prevent you from having time to promote yourself to look for new work. The way I do it now, because I've actually had two stints at a portfolio career. I did it once. I went back into full time for about two years. I came back out again. What I do differently now is I only program four days of work. The fifth day is self-promotion. It is looking for new business. You think of it, you're a salesperson. You're selling yourself. You need to maintain this level of work. And if I'm really honest, what I did before, I didn't program five days of work. I just took work and did it. And I realise now that was a mistake. Very fortunate that I enjoy what I do, but that can also be a curse because you can be ending up working seven days a week by having that day that is not working for clients. It's, it's working for yourself, making sure you have a good website. It gives you the opportunity to do, uh, for me personally, I will do media appearances, not for a client, but just presenting myself as an expert. That will generate interest. Blogging just for me, not for clients, that has sparked interest as well and just recording things that I'm doing and presenting that to the world I use Twitter a lot 
but I started moving some of that sort of personal update stuff away from Twitter and onto my own website because social media, the way things surface, yeah. I started spending time to actually update my own website to keep a record of that, to keep a record of achievements, of things that I've been writing here and there. I don't know how, how common it is for, for people to do this, but for me personally, it really works to have a, one day a week where I am promoting myself and I'm needing to then get what I need for my income for the other four days. And that's no bad thing, I think. I don't think that's a bad thing at all. I think that's really great advice. Definitely something that I found quite difficult. Always go back over trying to find that balance is that life admin Yes. And also that promotion stuff is so key, but often gets pushed down to the bottom of the pile until yeah. it's almost too late. Like you've, then you've got to rush, then you've got to push yourself. It's infrastructure as well. It's boring things like, you know, having a really good email system, having your cloud storage sorted. You know, these are the sorts of things you do on that day. Spending time to make sure you have the right equipment that you need. All of this kind of stuff is an investment in yourself and it takes time. I don't want to be doing it in the gaps of time I have between other things and not making good choices and going back to what are you selecting for the work that you're going to do. If you're doing that without time to really think about it, then you're probably not going to make the greatest choices. And if you're fully programmed with work, and maybe you've made choices where the rate isn't so high and you are unable to take on new work. You think, oh, well, I'm happy with what I've got. I don't want to let this client down. If you're creating that cushion of, of time that you have that much more flexibility, you can go for and get better work. Absolutely. We've spoken about passion and obviously being an advocate for charities is a, a real passion of yours. And I know from experience of giving to charities where it may be seen as unreciprocal. However, I often get so much more from it than others expect. What's the greatest reward for you from this kind of work? The work that I'm doing is advocating for policy change, trying to get government to do things differently. The big rewards are few and far between, but you do see that you make change. So two years ago, I produced a report highlighting the lack of funding for bus services outside of London, great bit of timing, getting in front of the right people. My report was cited at Prime Minister's Question Time by the Leader of the Opposition. Incredible to, to see that recognition. And then later down the line, it was a success. We secured funding good so that bus services outside London could be maintained and improved. And I enjoy the whole process of that, the whole process of producing research, getting coverage, do a lot of media work, get, uh, getting our story out there. And then ultimately, because that's the destination, is to make change, to make change in the world. And to see that is incredibly rewarding to me. As you say, you often do a lot of media work. And as an expert in your field, you're called upon for this. And whether that's whether you're speaking or whether you're on TV or whether you're lecturing, what advice would you give to someone who is looking to create more of a presence from speaking as part of their portfolio career? Okay. I knew I wanted to become a lecturer, media spokesperson as an opportunity came up. Yeah. But for the being a lecturer, I knew I wanted to do it. I didn't know, however, that I had all the skills that I needed for it. So I invested in myself, is what I'm saying. I put myself on a PGCE course for two years, which is a teacher training course. You can actually be a lecturer with no training whatsoever, but I wanted to be the best I could be at doing that. Brilliant. And there was an element of pragmatism. The government were paying money at the time for you to you know, do this course. It, was, it made a lot of sense. This was coming out of the 2008 financial crisis. So that was when my portfolio career began. That's one piece of advice I'd give. A crisis is a perfectly good time <laughs> to start a portfolio <laughs> career. Yeah, you know. absolutely. And it was an opportunity that came up. I knew I wanted to do it. I knew I wanted to come in and do this role. And I didn't want to be rubbish at it. I wanted to be as best I could be. And for me, the way to do that was to invest in myself. And I'm always learning in one way or another. But that's what I did at the time. I taught sociology in a sixth form college or further education college in West London in Ealing and I got my PGCE and I felt super confident then going into university. I'd had some offers to do teaching work at that point but I actually turned them down. Oh, I need to have this investment in myself, I want to do it right, I don't want to do this and not, you know, not be so great at it. In my head teaching was something I thought I was going to do very much towards the end of my career. Okay. I'm thinking very much like a year ahead, six months ahead, whatever, but I'm also thinking down the line, we're going to work 
into what is normally retirement and we yeah. need to be mindful of that and there's lots of reasons for that not all financial it's going to be active for all this period of time we might want to actually you know do something so anyway I thought this would be something I would do then I had but obviously I wanted to get all the tools under my belt I wanted to have a have a stab at it opportunities came up again I started teaching and I loved it and I loved it because I was doing really well at it and I felt very confident about doing it my my kind of advice there for that is you know as I invest in yourself the same with the media stuff as soon as it became apparent that I would be called on to do that I did media training it's affordable I think for for an individual to invest in themselves I think that is absolutely 100% worth doing it was just a one-day course but it taught me everything that I needed to know about that I'd already had a little bit of experience and that kind of helped so yeah my answer to that is is invest in yourself yeah and you'll find that those two roles a lecturer and a media spokesman or anything like that will just be so much easier easier on yourself so moving on from lecturing would you recommend anybody doing something like media training to advance themselves or to as you say invest in themselves and to take themselves to the next level I guess I think if there's a real chance that you're going to be doing media inquiries or if you've already started to do them I think that's the perfect time to do it so when I did it I'd only just started doing it it became apparent that I'd be doing more and that training it lasted a day I was able to connect with experiences that I'd already had so I'd say that's the moment to do it but my thing with training to to teach and also with with the media is this was something that I didn't feel super confident about it so that for me was the time that I knew I needed to do training some people just can go off and kind of do this you know be super confident and happy with it that's fine they have an innate thing for it but these experiences for me anyway tend towards being nerve-wracking potentially kind of experiences if you've got all your tools sorted that's going to make things a hell of a lot easier and remove a lot of that pressure. So if you're someone who does get nervous or in those kinds of situations, do yourself a favor and yeah. do that kind of training. So, and I'm sure that's true for many other kind of high pressure things like that. Make life easier on yourself. Yeah, yeah. I think often we make that assumption that we should know, and should is a, a terrible word as we know, but we should know how to do it first time off the bat. Whereas, as you say, like taking that time to actually invest in yourself is is so key. I'd like to go back a bit mm. and, and, and talk about how you started your career, because you started your career in marketing, not yeah. with specialism of town planning and sustainable transport. How did you get from there to here? So I kind of went as far as I think I was going to go in marketing, basically, mm-hmm. and I knew I wanted to do something different. I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do. Looking back now, I know the structure of nine to five wasn't right for me. But at the time, I was more focused on the idea that I was in the wrong profession. So I went back to university. I went back to university at 29. I did an undergraduate degree. I learned through the undergraduate degree, which is social policy, that I was interested in urban issues, things about the built environment and transport. I did a dissertation specializing on that areas within this social policy degree. And that meant I could go on to do a master's degree in urban planning. So I used the master's degree as a fine tuning tool, graduated from that out of into the uh, financial crisis. That meant that a lot of options were were less viable. Full-time employment was less viable because I, been going down that kind of specialism route already at that point you can see the fine tuning of my interests and my subject area and I was blogging I was blogging then I was going to events I was talking invited to speak at events because I was identified even at that stage as a researcher as having a subject specialism so I was self-promoting then invited to speak at things and then opportunities came up but they were part-time they were advisors of a consultant so effectively I started my consultancy around 2010 and then as I said before I knew I wanted to get somewhere and I wanted to I wanted to be doing teaching I wanted to be a university lecturer and that's how I spent some of my time in education I think I was using the portfolio career as a means to support educating myself and then coming out of the PGCE and, and, and kind of moving forward what I've found is The work that I had been doing, so I was a consultant advisor. 
I saw a campaigning job advertised in my specialism area, very niche in my specialism area, in particular transport. And I'd never thought of myself as a campaigner, but I read it. I was like, well, that's what I do. <laughs> These are my skills, you know, the communications. You know, I already had that from my marketing career. So even that career that I abandoned has had value and, and I Absolutely. refer to it when it's useful. And the subject knowledge in particular, because this is this world I'm talking about policy change. Well, to change policy, you need to know policy. And I applied for it and it was a two day a week job. I got it. And then I became a, a campaigner. Then the teaching opportunities came up and I was doing more. And, and so at that point, I was maybe a three way split lecturer, campaigner, consultant advisor, which is pretty much what I am now. And that's that's how I got there. Yeah. That's fantastic to hear. And what I love about talking about people's journeys is the fact that a portfolio career never really is fixed. It can be what you need it to be at whatever time. For example, you know, supporting you through your education, but that's part of your portfolio career. And then later being able to get three way split. Um, we've talked a bit about, you know, obviously like balancing your week by mm. having the opportunity and taking that time to reinvest in yourself but how do you find balance and prioritize between your roles between your responsibilities whilst also creating that work-life balance yeah that can be difficult because clients often like your availability every day for them rather than setting aside this is Monday I'm going to work for you and, and what I'm not going to check emails for a week yeah, yeah that, you know, <laughs> they kind of bleed into each other but that is something that, that's really kind of valued. I think technology is the answer. I use multiple email addresses, individual email addresses for clients. So it can, so stuff is sorted that way and different cloud storage, ensuring that files, they don't bleed into each other is what I'm saying. Yeah. And um, I really keep them kind of separate. I'm not quite sure how I juggle it. Right? I, th I feel like just leaving enough time and not having too much work really helps. Because if I was answering this question before, like the previous time I was, I was working like this, it was chaos, if I'm really honest. <laughs> I just did, you know, I did work at you know, deadlines with Jira. I was going from one thing to another. I was doing incredibly long days. Mm -hmm. I was earning less as well. That's the thing. I really cannot stress that enough. If you make better choices, you will you will earn more. So, yeah. you know, working like that, having too much work is just not a good recipe. Finding it very difficult to take holidays as well because of that kind of, you know, organising like that. Now I'm much more disciplined. I'm not especially setting aside days for individual clients. I do work, I will work for multiple clients at a time. Some things have to happen at a particular time, lecturing. Obviously, you know, you're in the room at that time. Interestingly, in the COVID era, I'm traveling less and yeah. that helps. I feel like I have more time. So when I was like going between clients and going to lecturing, whatever, a lot of time was spent traveling, yeah. often, you know, meals grabbed while traveling feels like the theme of how my life was. And there's less of that now. I am traveling a bit more for work, which is lovely, but it's not, not, it's not racing between meetings. Yeah. So that's helped. I mean, honestly, I think the answer to what I'm saying is don't give yourself too much to do. Be organized. I use very basic like Trello style yeah. sort of task management. I think that works, works for me. Uh, but yeah, I really do think that the number one thing is don't, just don't overload yourself. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's really great advice. Do you, and especially for people who are facing making that jump towards a portfolio career. Is there any advice that you would give for somebody trying to make the decision of, should I stay in, their nine, in, in my nine to five or should I actually make this jump? I mean, there's a lot of people at the moment who are facing redundancy or yeah. are... Uh, on furlough and not sure what's coming up or even just not happy in what they're doing and they've realized after being stuck in it and not having feeling not feeling like they have a way out what would, mm. you, what would that advice be well I've, I've kind of got recent experience that as I said I went back to full-time work for two years mm -hmm. had two experiences where I thought actually this isn't the right thing for me I'm going to go back to a portfolio career and it's really hard to set one up from um, scratch or while you're in that employment full-time if you can, and I've seen people do this, and this might be a, a good way, if you can negotiate going down to four days for a while and use the fifth day, almost like I do, to st start up, get your first client in, do something else, whatever, that's one way of doing it. But honestly, starting a portfolio career is like someone who says they're going to go on a round-the-world trip. Um, the hardest thing for them is to just buy the ticket. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, buy yourself the ticket and... There's a lot of anxiety about, you know, earnings and, and all that kind of stuff. 
I mean, not everyone's going to be able to do this, I know, but if you can, try and find a way to get your finances sorted so you could live with reduced income for six months. Yeah. And maybe not up to the level where you really want to be for a year, but six months of like, you know, really reduced income, then maybe another six months of not quite where you want to be, allowing for that. That will actually help you because you will remove the anxiety and you won't make bad decisions. So you'll end up earning more anyway because you will make better choices. You won't pick up work and then not be able to do the better thing because you've you've picked up something else. But really, if you can get that six months organized, if you're already in that employment, maybe you know you put some money aside. I know everyone can't do that. I know that it's an incredibly privileged thing to be able to do that. But if you can, it will remove that anxiety and you'll just enjoy it more. It's not fun doing it with anxious feeling, oh, I've got to get some work, I've got to get some work, because you look terrible <laughs> to, to everyone. Yeah, you, you know, absolutely the, do, absolutely. And also one bit of advice I had recently, which, which is good for everyone in a portfolio career, but especially at the start, if you are not embarrassed asking for your rate, then it's set too low. And then, you know, it's, it's a marketing rate. It's a starting point for a conversation. But if you are not embarrassed, a little bit embarrassed, asking for this amount of money, then you've set it too low. You yeah. really don't sell. You, I mean, let's be honest, at the beginning of a portfolio career, you might make choices that are not the same as later on. You want to get some work. You want to be in the world you need to be in. Going back to the idea of things that are more stable, but maybe not so well paid. Also look at what is this organization like? Who's in it? What's their network? Networking is one of the most powerful things in a portfolio career. So you might choose a gig that gives you access to people. Who, you know, I'm, you know, I just saw projects that might have an extended kind of governance that has you know, influential people in a particular area. That's good to be part of, you know. So you might make some decisions again, for, for a lower rate that are around not just stability, but like, you know, where could I go on to next from this role? Mm -hmm. So I really, really advise some very careful choices around that, trying to juggle all these different needs to eat, <laughs> but also, you know, kind of where, where am I going to go? Where could this bring me on to next? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, how you have a side hustle can work in so many different ways. And if you can like reduce your hours down to four days a week and then have that day to explore that's a brilliant option and it's great advice i found doing work in the evenings and at the weekends to start my side hustles um, and start my portfolio career that way worked for me Good for you. <laughs> but you do work on long hours and long days and it, it's not sustainable and that's a great place to start but don't do it forever because you get no. very tired. <laughs> I guess that's that's a piece of advice that I would give myself if I was to restart my career at any point. But is there anything that you would do differently if you had a chance to restart anywhere along your career path, really? Yeah, so the one thing, as I say, I've done differently is having that day for yeah. kind of self-promotion for, for new business, I think, or a period of time programming and having that Mm -hmm. um kind of in there this, again the second time I did it going back I was I was more chill about finding work I guess I know because I've done it before I knew I would, you know it'll work out in the end and do you know what I thought it would take much longer to get back where I was before it took six months yeah it took six months to get back and earning more than I was before better quality gigs uh, more respected in a, you know in, in a lot of these you know really valued for my contribution mm -hmm. it took me six months yeah I thought I gave myself a year I, in my head I was thinking this could take a year you've got to you know prepare for that it didn't so yeah try and be chill <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> you, know, I, you know you've got to be you will make bad choices if you're kind of anxious so that's that's one thing I definitely did differently being potter on the self-promotion I was saying no more <laughs> I don't, some people I don't know if that's a problem but sometimes you do have to say no or you know working out a way that something is going to work for you and if it's not then it's not the right it's not the right opportunity yeah that, I mean that's really important if, you, if you're not saying no then are you saying how does this actually work for me so often we just say yes and then realize it's it's not the right thing later down the line don't we yeah Finally, and, and this is a question that I go back to again and again, but it is something that a lot of people look to and everybody's looking for the 
for the answer on how to succeed. And actually that looks Mm. different for all of us. How do you define success where you are in your career now? And does that look any different to how it did in the past? How do I define success? I'm thinking a lot about where I'm going next now. So one thing I've got into recently is I've started exploring directorships of like organizations and I looked for things that I wanted to kind of expand into that were useful for me or I could bring something there. So success for me now is kind of what new opportunities are being yielded by my work. Yeah. I get bored quickly. So that's something I've learned about myself. That's why I'm in a portfolio career. Mm -hmm. And I've actually learned that I need to start very early thinking about the next thing because heaven help me if I get to a position where I'm, oh, okay, I'm really bored now because (laughs) that's disastrous. So having that kind of thing a bit bit earlier, thinking about that, I'm very lucky opportunities do come to me. I'm I'm actually quite... Well, I talk about self-promotion, that's marketing. I'm actually quite a lazy salesman. I'm not great about going out there. I like when opportunities come to me. I should do more in in that area but you know we are where we are but for me it is about looking at the opportunities that I, that I have coming in and are and are they where I want to be is it going to be interesting for me is it going to be you know, fairly remunerated that to me is success because I'm enjoying the steps on the way and I want to be doing things in future that are enjoyable mm-hmm. that's success for me I think really but the keeping it going in that way yeah, that's that's really good advice. And this whole conversation, thank you so much for your time because there's been so many snippets of brilliant advice um, that I think is going to help so many people who are already in a portfolio career but looking to maybe restart one or, or get into one now. So yeah, thank you so much for your time. I think I'm going to wrap up there, but I wish you every success with all your next ventures. Thank you. Thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs>